Hello, thank you everybody for being with us today. Uh, my name is Stephanie Marquez and I am joined by Juan Menendez. But before we get to introductions, we're gonna talk today just a little bit about process optimization in regards to supply management before you begin your journey to Cloud Suite. So again, my name is Stephanie Marquez. I'm a principal supply chain consultant here at RPI. I've been a part of this team for about four and a half years. Uh, I've participated in several in four FSM Cloud Suite implementations during my tenure. Uh, prior to that, I've worked in supply chain in one role or another for about the last 14 years uh, as a buyer, logistics and receiving, sourcing, contracts, pretty much a little bit of everything. Uh, prior to working here at RPI, I worked in healthcare uh, within supply management for a large healthcare system here in Western New York. So Juan, I'm very, very happy to be here with you today. Thank you, Stephanie, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Juan Menendez, and I'm a senior principal consultant here at RPI. I've worked in the healthcare supply chain world probably about over 35 years, um, and I've been a consultant primarily in healthcare and some public sector on and off since 1996. Uh, some of my healthcare experience has included uh, being a senior director of supply chain for surgery, cath lab, and interventional radiology. Um, I handled, obviously, uh, the entire operation of the case card system in that OR, which also included our offsite outpatient surgery centers, which we supplied all the cases for them. We also, I was also in charge of the cath lab um, and interventional radiology, which had many um, different bill and replace items. They also were using the point of use system. We had an item master of about 20,000 items within that item master in surgery uh, with many of those items that are bill only and bill and replace. Um, also, before I left the organization, um, we had actually brought up contract management prior to moving to the cloud suite, which provided the organization with a better process to manage those special type of items um, within the price file that we'll talk yeah. a little bit more as we go along. Yeah, you're bringing a lot of years of expertise, so I'm excited to have this conversation with you. Uh, so just a little bit of how today's going to go. We're, we're going to be focusing on that process optimization uh, with an emphasis on bill only and bill and replace, as well as implementing cycle counting uh, schedules for your perpetual inventory, both of which can be implemented in your current loss and system prior to your Cloud Suite migration. That'll definitely help pave the way uh, for that migration. So let's mm -hmm. just hop right to it. Um, so we're gonna talk about impact. Um, and when we think about future state or projects as large as Cloud Suite implementations, part of the pre-planning and planning phases is to uh, dissect, if you will, what processes within your organization and business areas are strong and efficient and which ones operate like a well-oiled machine versus those that you know could maybe use a little bit of TLC. So let's start off with bill only and bill and replace. From your experience, you have a ton of it. Um, I, I think we can say that it, also in my experience, a lot of the healthcare clients that I have worked with um, have a pretty manual process uh, to fulfill the bill only and bill and replace business need. So Juan, I'm, I'm interested to hear from you. Can you give us a little bit more detail about what type of manual processes that you've seen with some of your clients? Sure, uh, Stephanie, and I, I think when we started talking about what we would like to present today, this is the first thing that came to my mind as far as manual mm -hmm. processes are concerned. And when we say manual processes, uh, what we mean is like during the surgical procedure, the nurse or the clinical staff, um, they get the implant log sheet and they take the stickers off the implants as they're being um, put into the patient and they put them on those paper log sheets. Those paper log sheets eventually make their way from the OR to the buyer or, or supply chain individual that buyer or supply chain person will then enter the detail information from the log into an Infor requisition manually. And that would include all the information such as the case information, the patient information, and of course the item detail, which, uh, which, mean, which could mean the lot and serial number, the expiration date. So there's a lot of information that's manually entered um, during that procedure, and that's at the point of requisition. And remember that the clinical staff also need to manually enter that information or document it in their OR system, such as Epic or Cerner, um, because it's required. So the, the clinical staff is still searching for that item in their clinical system to actually document that item in that clinical system. Um, what we find is that the manual process is really labor intensive, both for the clinical folks and the operational support team. Um, and at times I've been in places where it could take several days for that case 
um, after the patient procedure has been completed to actually go through the entire reorder process. So it could be done on, a, the case could be done on Monday, that procedure might, or that requisition may not be entered until Wednesday. So it's, there's always delays when it comes to this, especially when, you know, it depends how busy the organization is. So that's why we felt that this particular issue was one we wanted to discuss with today as far as the manual process. Yeah, and when I hear manual process, it's kind of like a red flag for me of, you know, extra room for error. It's kind of what I think about, especially if you're talking about a case sheet, like a physical sheet that somebody has to walk mm -hmm. somewhere else or apply a sticker to, what if the sticker falls off, you know, different things like that. Um, you also sure. uh, said labor intensive. And so labor intensive, right. I kind of want to break that down a little bit. So can you help us to mm -hmm. understand, you know, quantify it for us? Like, what do you mean when you say labor intensive? Sure. Um, and again, this could be this can vary based on different criteria, such as the size of the organization, the volume of procedures that are being done within that surgery area. But a fair estimate, I'd say, with the bill only, the man could run between three and four individuals before that order is even placed. And those individuals would include like a clinician or a nurse, supply chain individual. It I, I obviously has to go to the vendor and the receiving staff is involved. An example I can give you is I was at a client recently, um, and that buyer was spending minimum four hours a day, and that was on the low end, depending on the number of cases, for about 15 cases a day. And I actually timed her without her really knowing that I was doing it, because I just wanted to have an idea. And it was very manual. Overall, she was spending probably about 30 hours a week just entering in those requisitions. Yikes. And I want to make it clear that that depends on the number of items on the procedure. So if there's 10 items on the procedure, that person has to look up those 10 items into the system to place on the requisition. And it also depends on the volume of cases. Um, I also want to point out that this time spent does not include any receiving activity. Uh, the receiving is still has to be done because they're ordering these items um, as a bill only, but they're not code. She wasn't coding them as bill only. So receiving mm -hmm. still needed to occur. And it doesn't account for the clinical staff having to search for the items within Optime or their Cerner system to place that item on the case. So they're documenting the case. They're still having to search um, for those items to actually place on the case. Um, so that, own, that timing that I did was only for the supply chain staff. And it still was an enormous amount of time. And that and I remember that week I was there, it was actually a slow week. <laughs> so <laughs> imagine when it's a very large week. Right. And she even told, and she even admitted, she, admit, she admitted to me that 80 to 90% of her time every week was dedicated to entering bill only items. Yeah, that's a lot. And one thing too, that we lot. often, we often talk about in, in supply chain is like the impact to other work streams. And for this process specifically for bill only and bill and replace mm -hmm. what i'm hearing is that the impact itself is realized by other business areas and you know that right. it's not just affecting the resources isolated to supply chain you know you're, you're talking about clinicians you're you know certainly supply chain um receiving the vendors um i would even bet to wager that you know our our collaborative friends in finance mm -hmm. right and making sure our vendors are paid mm -hmm. timely mm -hmm. can be impacted by of any type course. of delays with this process too so i assume just based on your experience and, and knowing you and having worked with you for so long that you've worked with mm -hmm. clients that have said, you know what, yes, we have to do a, an overhaul to this process. We need to make it easier. We need to make, you know, instead of her spending 30 hours a week, I only want her spending 10 to 15 hours a week on this process. And so I would imagine that you've done some uh, improvements. So let's let's kind of switch gears a little bit and let's talk about solution, right? So I know we're sure. not going to dive super into solutioning, but give me an overview mm -hmm. of what you've seen work in the past. Sure. Um, and yes, I've actually done this uh, several times. Ma, the last time that I did this type of implementation, they were very manual, as I stated before. Um, it was during the log sheets to get down to purchasing, and it was that complete manual process. So mm -hmm. we automated the entire thing. And they had seven, this was seven different hospitals with seven surgical suites, with seven wow. individual ORs within those hospitals. Um, of course, the solution here can be quite involved. But by the end of the day, we're talking about leaning into that technology and that automation that they currently own. 
And to mm -hmm. oversimplify what I mean by implementing that this allows the clinical folks to actually scan the item used on the procedure um, in the clinical system wedge scanner. A lot of the clinical systems have those wedge scanners that they use for medications, but we would mm -hmm. use those wedge mm -hmm. scanners to actually scan the item and it would populate onto the screen. That process would begin the automation to pick up the transaction and route it accordingly. So as the clinicians close the case, they've scanned the items, we pick up that transaction and it can go through the approval process also. So if you have approvals in place for your requisitioning process, we can route it accordingly through the approval process. This will ultimately create a bill only PO, not needing a receipt or a bill and replace, which then would require to go out to the vendor until the item comes in and receipt will occur. Um, but for our folks using currently using Landmark V10 contract management, they can even leverage the what I call the virtual item master, meaning special items that are not built in the item master, only kept in contract management. We can pass those items to the clinical systems, increasing their efficiency that much more for the clinical teams to be able to document simply by scanning the barcode if available or searching the catalog. And I would mm -hmm. say for implants, probably 90 over 90% of them are actually scannable. You can scan the item to the case. And then there's that 10% that um, don't scan or are in an actual sterilized container, which mm -hmm. the box has already been opened. Mm -hmm. So, but those you could still by searching because you're loaded that information in, they can search for it in the clinical system and pass that information over um, to the Infor um, automation system. Mm -hmm. um, so the process of implementing automation has several different varieties and the complexities and those requirements are dependent on that organization. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> it's not it's not a one size fits all. Um, no, I know it's we're not. we're going to talk about maybe risks or, or things to look out for if this is a process that mm -hmm. organizations are going to consider implementing. But before we do that, I want to talk mm -hmm. about uh, another process optimization that we've seen clients implement, and I mm -hmm. think one that is pretty near and dear to your heart. So talk to me about the implementation of cycle counts for perpetual inventory. Let's just kind of dive right into it. Sure. And and yes, I am very passionate about it because I've done in my time of doing in for loss and implementation, I've done over 40 of them. And mostly um, many of them, if not all of them, did have inventory. And those that failed managing inventory is because they didn't do cycle counting. And I am a firm believer of doing this. Um, it's really critical to know that the key area of implementing cycle count is when you do that count, the timing of the count. So you have to really have to take a step back and look at the current processes within that inventory department. For example, when do you pull items for a PAR? When is the receiving occurring? When are you picking items that are coming through for demand? And when do you replenish your inventory? You have to look at that whole picture to determine when you're actually going to do the cycle count, meaning freeze the records, perform the count, and then unfreeze the records. Okay. Um, so that's really it. You have to take a step back and looking at it. Um, when you're actually going to try and implement cycle counting. Yeah, I think too, um, when we've addressed this process with clients before, there's the misconception or the misunderstanding that if I'm doing mm -hmm. a cycle count, people can't order, right? They can't enter requisition or their requisition is going right. to get an error. So uh, let, let's put that, you know, question to bed. Go ahead and and tell yeah. us, right? This, this is the first question. A lot of people, I, people that have been using the system for 10 years will ask me that also. When can I actually do it? All transactions can occur. So when you freeze an inventory, when you're going to do it through, this, through the cycle count process in Infor, all you are doing is taking a snapshot of what your on-hand count is at that particular moment. But all transactions can occur during that freeze, meaning that you can do issues, returns, you can do replenishment if you want to, you can do receiving, all of those transactions can occur. Now, you have to take into account that when you do a freeze and the system thinks you may have 10 of an item and somebody walks into your department, inventory is frozen, somebody walks in and takes one of those items, you have to account that item into your account so that you know the process goes through correctly. But you can do all transactions during a full uh, cycle count process. I have another question for you, and I think I know what you're going to mm -hmm. say, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, 
you know, sure. in my experience, inventory trucks that are coming into, whether it's healthcare or any facility for that matter, usually are coming in pretty early in the day. Um, is there a better mm -hmm. time of day that, you know, folks should consider uh, implementing this process into their inventory control? Absolutely. And again, that goes back to it really depends on the organization. But from my experience, and it actually the department that I ran, mm -hmm. it really was better after the PARs were picked, um, once receiving has been done and put away, meaning from your primary vendor. So if you're an Owens client or, uh, you know, a Cardinal client, you know, those primary items are put away in the morning as much receiving as possible, obviously, mm -hmm. um, and before the reorder process is done. Why I say that? Because it makes identifying issues or incorrect stock on hand quantities easier. I want to articulate that this is something done every single day. This becomes right. part of your daily process in the department. I also want to add that the fastest and the most efficient way to do this is through using leveraging your handhelds, your mobile handheld system. You can still do it on paper. You can go around and still count on paper and enter those directly into the system, but the handheld is most the most effective way of doing it. So it really depends, you know, the, the hours of operation. And again, that's where I say you have to step back, look at all your processes and feel uh, and fit that in. But I would do it when there's least amount of transactions occurring, whatever time yeah. that may be during the day. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. I appreciate you yeah. offering your insight. I, I, I want to sure. say I think it's probably safe to say that both of these process optimizations really have a significant impact just on the organizational processes as a whole. And and we didn't talk about this, but I'm just going to say it. I'm, I'm assuming that includes, you know, the bottom line for the organization, you know, any sort of like right. financial impact, um, you know, it, but with anything that we do, whether it's a, mm -hmm. a, a process optimization or, you know, mm -hmm. a change in a new system, there's going to be some risks associated with it. There's going to even be risks associated with foregoing process optimizations. So I kind of want to get mm -hmm. us started on that. You know, um, as you were talking, really doing a fantastic job of, of stressing from your experience kind of where, where those hangups and heartaches might be. One thing mm -hmm. that comes to mind immediately, immediately for me is really both of these process optimizations I assume will require some dedicated resources. Yeah. Um, so I think that it's important to, to, you know, for an organization leadership to say, okay, we want to do this process. I've now identified my subject matter expert and, and resource that individual accordingly. Um, you mm -hmm. know, timing is going to play an integral role in it. You know, maybe sure. some shuffling of competing projects. But in my experience, when you have that prioritization of competing projects, it, it can make a huge difference. The day-to-day -day work yeah. still has to get done, right? It still has to happen. Um, and being intentional about dedicating the time, whether it's mm -hmm. day by day, per week, or uh, you know, even going into your calendar and saying, okay, four hours, you know, uh, twice a week is what I need to focus on for this project. But having leadership support um, mm -hmm. in that yeah. is going to be crucial just to the success. Otherwise, something like that could, you know, draw out forever. So from your perspective, in addition mm -hmm. to, you know, resource and allocation, um, I'm curious to see what are some other risks or things that some of our uh, attendees should, you know, consider if they intend on uh, leveraging these types of process optimizations. Sure, Stephanie. And I think the biggest thing, obviously, is the data sources that have to be identified and clean. Let's talk about the bill only or bill and replace process. And what that means is that somebody would have to identify what items are specific to bill only. Um, and um, are these items in the item master or are they coming through contracts, you know, as special items? And you could also leverage your vendors to assist you on this data cleanse or this data identifier to see where those items are. From there, somebody would need to analyze that data to, the, to ensure that the appropriate G10, so scanning can occur. The G10 would be the scanning number that's on the actual package. You would want to make sure that that's loaded and identify any other codes associated to the item. So if they want a lot or serial track or expiration track, you want to make sure that that build is in the system itself. Additionally, this process has a heavy technical footprint, meaning mm -hmm. that you have inbound and outbound interfaces between the clinical system and Infor that have to be developed properly and tested with multiple parties. 
Obviously, this has been done in many other clients. This is not new for somebody who's using, let's say, an Optime or a Cerner system with Infor. These, in, these, these interfaces have already been established within other organizations. So they're not recreating the wheel. It's just identifying the necessary fields that are going to feed between these two systems. Um, and obviously, this isn't something that could be accomplished solely on supply chain management. Um, you would right. obviously need IT involvement, uh, probably OR or somebody within the clinical staff that would be heavily involved in this. <clears throat> also, as we have mentioned earlier, both of these processes, bill only and cycle calling, really do they really do impact operational efficiencies. I spoke about how manual bill only processes can be and often is and very takes so much extra time to yeah. actually complete. Um, versus could you imagine that they scan an item in an OR and that process goes through automatically without any manual intervention whatsoever. Um, right. that, that is huge. <clears throat> and then there's the operational inefficiencies associated with not doing cycle counts, meaning that your organization might likely have incorrect quantity on hand. Somebody's probably, and I'm sure of it, walking the shelves every single day to make sure what the actual counts are. What are they missing? Because obviously your reorder might and almost definitely be off against what the reorder is telling you to place. Right. So, so if you trigger an order, you have to fix those counts prior to triggering that order. Um, also, it increased the likelihood of stockouts, increased timing to regenerate that replenishment versus the reduction in time to generate a replenishment when you rely on your daily cycle count. Um, the cycle count process will significantly reduce or eliminate the manual reorder process of walking the department. Not only have I seen this and implemented this, but I've also worked this in my department that I actually was the director for. I've seen this work. So it's not just like here say, oh, I implemented it. I actually have walked the walk here when it comes to this. That's why I'm passionate about the cycle counts and, and having them part of your routine daily process. Yeah, part of the day to day built in, you know, um, right. as I mentioned right. earlier, we we kind of identified that, you know, so mm -hmm. both of these processes really could have an impact downstream, like in finances, we're paying vendors, but sure. there also seems to be a financial uh, risk associated with these as well. So what I mean by that is, in, in my experience, mm -hmm. I've seen organizations carrying way too much inventory you know inventory that's yes. bought in bulk we think we need it let's overstock and then it sits for you know 12 months mm -hmm. and it doesn't go anywhere and that directly relates to potential overspend you know by those um departments and and just impacting budgets and all that kind of good stuff so i think it's obvious but to me daily cycle counts are certainly going to uh, play a positive role and be a definitely definite viable solution for cost savings mm -hmm. effort reduction right. and, and right. right sizing of that inventory so you don't you know have a ton of inventory sitting on your shelves for for months on end going unused oh absolutely um and i'll just give you from examples from the organization that i was the director i remember when i first started and no cycle counts were being done and obviously cycle counts what you just said earlier really will help you leverage your min and max levels your on-hand shelf quantity that you want to keep on those shelves so that you don't run out of stock okay because mm -hmm. you especially when you're talking surgical services so what happens there is people overstock those shelves and i remember taking over that surgery department when i first started there i had so much cleaning supply meaning the scrubs for your hands for the surgeons the mask and um all of that stuff that go into sub, -sub sterols i didn't order any of that for six months when we <laughs> implemented real pars and real cycle counting I swear I didn't order any substerile stuff for six months. We had so much of it. We kept it right. in an elevator area because we had so much stock. Uh, it was actually crazy. And when I implemented cycle counts, um, once I implemented them in that surgery department, um, and we did it routinely every single day, I never again had to do year-end physical inventory. My wow. finance person knew our numbers were that good that they told us we did not have to do a year-end physical ever again. And we never did. I was there almost 10 years uh, after the first year. I never did a physical inventory because we did them routinely. And our accuracy for on hand was when I started, it was probably a little under between 40 and 43% accuracy. After we'd implemented cycle counting, it went up above 89%. And that was in the first year. We calculated that in the first year, um, we were at 89% accuracy of our on hand counts. That's how we were able to use the automatic reorder. Um, for right. our physical inventory because our cycle counts were so, they were so good. 
Yeah, and uh, you so know those, those, those are real examples, obviously. Yeah, and the, those percentages are directly tied to dollar signs as well, as far as savings Absolutely. are concerned. You know, I mean, to me, oh, that yeah. that's huge. You're talking, you're talking, you know, about a forty percent increase in accuracy. Mm -hmm. Like that's just insane. So, job well done to you and your team. Uh, Thanks. You know, getting that, getting that done. <laughs> Yeah, so, it was a big effort. And I, oh, I did want to add, and I thought about this recently, I did want to add, um, we actually calculated our on-hand dollar amount. And in the first year, because we were supposed to, we leveraged our cycle counting and, our, and really looked at our, you know, our on-hand, we reduced inventory. And granted, I had over 2,500 items within that perpetual. There, and there were high dollar ticket items. We reduced inventory mm -hmm. by like $1.13 million the first year. Wow. Wow. because we managed it correctly and we managed right. our on-hand quantity correctly. So we were right. able to do that. You know, obviously cycle counting was one of the big factors of it, but there were other factors in place, but that was the big one, obviously. That well, yeah. That manage that so it's dollar you, amount. You know, it's, you've got, so you have the actual dollar amount associated with the, with the improvement into your inventory process, but you also, I'm sure somebody calculated it somewhere, right? You're decreasing the amount of labor and time that it takes, you know, for somebody walking the shelves all of the time. They can focus oh, yeah. their their um, their energy into something else Effort. that needs to be happening, right? And and right. being able to be more thorough and and probably improving just other day to day stuff as well. So, um, yeah, that's amazing. Right, I totally agree. Yeah, I mean, it's you own the system. You got to use it and leverage it. That's what we yeah, do. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. I, I have a I have a question for you. I'd really, and I think hopefully our attendees are kind of thinking the same thing I am because we're talking about two very significant processes that, mm -hmm. you know, really um, will force users to understand what they're doing current state and mm -hmm. identify how they want to move in the future. And mm -hmm. we're just talking about doing these, you know, before a cloud suite project, because we feel that strongly right. that they can benefit the organization. But if we wanted to help folks prioritize these projects in their mm -hmm. loss and system before moving to the cloud, do you have a specific recommendation as far as which process optimization people should really focus on? Uh, well, that's a good question. <laughs> Thank you for putting me on the spot there. No problem. Um, I would have to say, Steph, that I would probably recommend the bill only and bill and replace um, project to, because you're going to capture the most savings there. Why? Because these are high ticket dollar items. You're mm -hmm. going to capture the reduction in timing from the staff and cl the clinical staff alone having to search for items. They're documenting it, putting it on paper, and it's traveling through, like we said, the manual process versus just scanning the item when they're going to use it on the case and that process automate itself. So to me, I think you're going to get the most bang for your buck implementing the bill only and bill and replace process, the automation of that. I think that that would really make a huge difference and it affects more people. You know, cycle counting right. really affects the inventory, the inventory department. It's very important. Don't get me wrong. I think it's extremely important, but I think you're going to get more bang for your buck with the bill only and bill and replace. And it's, it's yeah. going to take a little longer to do that. Obviously, it takes a little you bit because of the interfaces. Well, you mentioned this earlier, and I think it's worth noting that mm -hmm. um, I think you had mentioned that the organization you came from had, you know, multiple ORs. And when we were preparing, mm -hmm. you know, for our conversation today, you made a comment about how um, you've seen clients say, OK, I want to focus on my bill and replace for, you know, mm -hmm. maybe this this one area. I want to get that up and going and then I can mirror that for everywhere mm -hmm. else. You know, you don't want to live and split processes too long. But again, you, and right. you said this multiple times, depending upon the size of the organization, the number of cases that are being done every day um, and just, you know, the overall volume um, is going to. Mm -hmm is going to be something to consider. So do you have anything just in your own experience where you've seen that happen? Is that, you know, we do that in other business areas. So I'm, I'm you know, thinking this is probably oh, a viable one as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, actually, when I was at Buffalo, an account in Buffalo, there were six hospitals. Mm -hmm. And we focused the bill and replace and the bill only in one in their largest facility. And mm -hmm. we streamlined it, we implemented it, we tested it, we did the whole thing. And so 
I did that, obviously I was a consultant there with the help of the client also. The client was involved and we had the technical team. All they did is mirror that same thing to the other six hospitals that they brought up and all hospitals were live within a year because they just oh, wow. the first hospital that we did and then we just did the rest of them. And right. they were very manual. They, in the clinical staff, didn't even use the scan. They would have to search for everything and use the implant log. And then they went from that to basically scanning and that had a rec approval process also. So it had the complexity that it had to go to the manager for approval and it would, it would land on the manager's desk. Uh, they would have to approve the requisition and then that rec process through and then it became a purchase order. So, but even with that, the recs were going out the same day. I mean, it just, it completely automated the entire thing. And we got that done in less than a year. That's really crazy. Did. I mean, that, that's amazing. And I brought them so... a perpetual too. And yeah, and we also, I, the, and the, the, the reason that we did that first is because I went in also, I perpetualized all their ORs. They were a manual OR operation and they wanted to go perpetual. So I assisted in doing that also. I brought them up on a perpetual inventory, all, all awesome. six hospitals. That's awesome. So yeah. let, let's take, let's bring it home, right? Like what can we sure. do to help? I want to just... Uh, put out there for maybe we have some attendees who haven't worked uh, with RPI in the past. I think we have a very unique team. I love our team. Um, and I obviously I'm biased, but I would say that any day of the week. And I think it's because we have so many individuals on our teams that just have so many years of experience and they've done projects mm -hmm. like this before. We've done projects like this before. And I think, you know, most of our team also has a unique component as well is that we've all not all we you know a good chunk of us have sat on the functional user side as well so we yeah. understand what it's like to have to be doing manual processes that really are you know just a, a, a time waster right and you yeah. know now kind of switching and consulting can really approach solutioning with our clients um, from from a, a, a wide angle so Mm -hmm. I said this earlier, there's never a one size fits all approach for projects like these. I know I no. would love to engage in some process optimization opportunities with clients, you know, and, and our objective is to really help our clients. You said this earlier, get the maximum system functionality of, you know, areas in the system that they own um, and those operational efficiencies. So when it comes time to implementing your cloud suite application and solution, right. th those right. teams can focus their efforts on new system functionality, you know, maybe enhancing autom automation that's existing rather than um, such a significant process improvement or process optimization task like these ones. So I know it can be difficult. Yeah. I think, um, you know, there are, are folks out there that maybe don't feel as if it's something that they can do at this time, um, whether it be, you know, financial affordability or lack of resourcing. You know, we know that organizations tend to run lean these days. Um, and I would say, you know, take a step back consider everything that we've presented today and really think about enlisting mm -hmm. professional services to support, you know, your on hand uh, employees, that staff, they're, they're generally allocated to completing their day to day with, you know, little or no additional hours for extra projects, or maybe they're already working on extra projects. Um, you know, right. the, the risk of not doing this type of work before your cloud suite implementation typically mm -hmm. results in, clients having to address done. these items <laughs> after the fact right and they and they oftentimes you not know, getting done they don't get done they don't we do see, no and I, well and i i want ahead. to tag on to that too Stephanie, yeah, because please. even clients that have moved to cloud i agree with you many of them will be like oh we don't have the time for it we just moved to cloud you know we got yeah. so much going on and we don't have time to implement but remember we were at a client recently who we brought up on cloud and we just brought up in conversation their bill only process and it was mm -hmm. very manual. And now they're interested in possibly implementing yeah. uh, the, the automation of bill only. So even clients that, those clients that are out there that are on cloud and are not doing this, it's something you yeah. should definitely look at. I highly recommend it. Yeah, absolutely. I highly recommend yeah. it. So I know we were focusing more on clients that are you know on V10 going to cloud, but then there's the clients that are already on cloud that could definitely utilize this that are not doing it. 
hundred percent. And even with that client specifically, we've, we've helped them already kind of outline their current process. So mm -hmm. they're easily able to identify where are the holes, you know, where, where right. do we need to make improvements? And that's where we can kind of help step in, whether that's uh, assisting on, you know, flowing out that current process or their build or, you know, helping to map interfaces, documentation, testing. There's there's just a number of different things where we, because we've done this before, because we've sat on the client side as clients, you know, can can really help to kind of fill in in the gaps there. So yep. I we definitely can guide hope them that, in the right direction. <laughs> absolutely. I definitely hope that it's something that folks will consider. Um, Mm -hmm. This has been awesome. I love doing these with you this as always. We don't have Same. an opportunity to work together really with clients. So this is a unique opportunity for us. So let's just kind of wrap it up and, and bring it home. Sure. So we covered, you covered a ton of content for us today, just about what organizations can do now before their Cloud mm -hmm. Suite implementation. That's just going to help to optimize their processes and position them for success in the future. You know, we talked about those impacts. We talked about the risks uh, as far as emphasis, uh, emphasis on bill only, bill and replace, right. as well as cycle counting. So Juan, thank you so much for sharing your thank experience you. and your insight with us. If anybody has any questions, um, you can certainly mm -hmm. reach out to us at questions at rpic.com. But uh, this is one of three within our supply chain series. Um, so stay tuned. Mm -hmm. Our next discussion in this series, I'm going to be joined by the amazing Ayana Brown. And she's going to talk to us about hey. why standard... Yeah, why standardization, <laughs> data cleanup, and implementing some best practices for data maintenance is essential for your business, and even more so mm -hmm. when you're preparing for the cloud. So, again, thank you, everybody. Thank you for your time. Thank you, thank Stephanie. Thank you for being with us. You thank great. you. I appreciate it, oh, yeah. and we hope to see yeah. you all soon.